Uh, first, a quick announcement. Uh, the, as the deadline for pro, uh, Checkpoint 2 is coming up, um, the Checkpoint 2 code review will happen um, in the coming couple of days or a couple of uh, the coming week or so. Uh, the, ch the sign up sheet is up, so if you haven't already done so, please go and sign up for a code review. All right. So the last couple of lectures, we've been talking about um, getting transactions to work in, uh, in parallel. Uh, we introduced this idea of serializability that says um, it's OK for me to execute instructions, uh, to interleave instructions of two different transactions, as long as those two transactions uh, maintain the illusion that both of them are uh, operating independently. Now, of course, interleaving transactions creates potential uh, correctness errors, but we'd like to preserve that kind of illusion. And recall that a transaction can basically be viewed as a sequence of reads, a sequence of writes, and then a final abort or commit statement. And what we'd like to preserve is this illusion that the order in which the reads are performed re uh, relative to two different transactions, uh, excuse me, the order reads and writes are performed uh, relative to two different transactions are preserved so that uh, a um, transaction that thinks it's alone actually ends up being alone. Um, or at least is under the illusion that it is alone. In the first, uh, let's, anyone see Sherlock Holmes, the second movie? Okay, that's lost on you, never mind. Um, so the second, the, the first approach that we took was to try and enforce this illusion, to net, avoid getting into a situation where that illusion could potentially be broken. And this was done by locking. Um, anytime we try and access an object, either read or write, uh, we lock the object. And then if another transaction tries to come along and lock the same object, we stop that transaction until um, the first transaction ends and can no longer be affected by that change. Now there's a problem with this. This is an extremely, extremely pessimistic view of the world, or an extremely pessimistic uh, approach to this problem. Uh, because there's many, many different case, uh, many, many different schedules that would allow us to continue um, in spite of the fact that two transactions are trying to manipulate the same data. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, so I have two transactions here. Uh, transaction one is being very, very slow. It uh, performs a write to A and then a write to B, and then eventually it commits. And then in the meantime, after transaction one is done with all of its writes, transaction two comes along and starts writing to A and then writing to B, and it, it eventually commits as well. Now, is this a serial schedule? Modulo the commit? Uh, I heard a no. Uh, no or yes? No. Why is that? So uh, not counting the commits, would this be a, a serial schedule if T1 uh, committed? If we assumed that T1 committed and we assume that T2 uh, committed, would this be a serial schedule? Hmm? Yeah, and you've hit on the point, uh, you, you've hit on the exact point uh, that we're trying to address here, which is that until T1 actually commits, T2 can't proceed. Um, whereas if we knew, if we uh, realized that at some point in the future um, T1 was uh, actually going to commit, then we could actually do something about it. Oh man, this, the contrast on these things is crap. Uh, anyway, if we knew that the transaction was going to commit, if uh, we 
I mean, we don't. That's the problem. We don't know what the transaction is going to do in the future. So we have to, by, when we take a locking-based approach, we have to be as pessimistic as, uh, as possible because we don't know what it's going to do. But, and in fact, we don't know what the transaction is going to do until it actually does it. So here's a thought. Why don't we actually let the transaction do it? Why don't we say, okay, uh, do whatever it is you're going to do, but then after you're done, you know, take a little bit of a breather, stop, and let's take a look and see if anything that you did do violates any uh, assumptions that we made or any of these uh, serializability property properties that we'd like to enforce. And only if the transaction violates something, then we do something about it. So this leads us to a uh, approach to concurrency control that's called optimistic concurrency control. And the idea is, well, we're going to let you do whatever you want. Uh, you know, modify these variables, modify those variables, do whatever you want, and we're going to assume that you're not going to break anything. And that's why it's called optimistic, because you're, you're assuming that nothing is going to break. But if something does break, we need a way to go back and, and reset anything that you've done. Okay, so optimistic concurrency control. In optimistic concurrency control, um, a transaction breaks down into three phases. The first phase, called the read phase, uh, or in the tr uh, first phase, called the read phase, the transaction basically gets a private copy of the database. And we'll go into how that gets implemented in the next couple lectures. But for now, let's just assume that we have a way of creating a private copy of the database for the transaction to, uh, to operate on. This is called the read phase. And that's basically what corresponds to the entire transaction in a locking-based approach. Then, after we finish the read phase, in other words, once the transaction has made all of the changes that it's going to make to its private copy, we check to see if anything that the transaction did during its read phase conflicts with anything that has already been committed to the database. And then finally, we actually take all of those changes, all of those modifications, and we actually apply them to the database. Uh, you're all familiar with git. This is essentially uh, the git push phase. Any questions on the high level idea? All right, great. So recall that the transaction is a bunch of reads, a bunch of writes. And so as the transaction is executing, recall, executing on its own private copy of the database, we're going to record every single read it performs as well as every single write that it performs. We call these the read set and the write set. So for a given transaction, the read set is the set of objects that it read from. The write set is the set of objects that it wrote to. And then, as these transactions are executing, we need to pick some sort of order that we're going to try and get these transactions to conform to. In other words, we need to pick some sort of serial order that the transactions are going to follow. Now, nominally, this can be done by just assigning an ID or a timestamp uh, to the transaction. So here's a question. If we're trying to pick a serial order for the transactions to follow, what's an appropriate time to pick or to, to insert a transaction into that order? The beginning of the read phase, before we start checking to see if the transaction uh, violated anything, 
So should we do it before the read phase, before we start checking for constraints? Well, we certainly can't do it after we start checking for constraints because the order that we're trying to, to conform to is part of that constraint. Hmm? Why, uh, so after the read phase, why would you say that? Uh, because we're not sure that there will be any conflicts. I think you're onto something there. So the validate phase needs to check for conflicts, right? It needs to check, and the simplest way to do that is to see if any of the transactions that came before it, uh, before the transaction that we're checking, uh, introduced any potential conflicts, right? I mean, we're checking for conflicts. We have to check all of the transactions beforehand to see if they introduced any conflicts. Do we care about any of the transactions that follow it in the serial order? No. I mean, they, they haven't happened yet. So what happens if we introduce a timestamp before the read phase? So transaction one, transaction, we start four transactions. And at the very beginning of the read phase, we say, you're transaction one, you're two, you're three, you're four. Let's say transaction three finishes first. Yeah, and two. Uh, so it has to wait for, uh, if transaction three finishes first, it has to wait for everything that came before it to finish as well, because, well, you don't know whether it's going to conflict with two or uh, with anything that one or two does. Okay, so we pick some serial, so after a transaction finishes its read phase, it's ready to commit, we're going to pick some serial order uh, for it to follow. In other words, we're basically just going to give it the next transaction ID that's available. And we're going to say, OK, this is the serial order. Make sure that you don't conflict with any of the transactions that happened before you. And this is where uh, the tricky bit begins. So what could we do to assure ourselves that this transaction doesn't interact with any other transaction that came before it? Remember, we have all of the objects that the transaction read from and all of the objects that the transaction wrote to. The read set and the write set. Sorry? Uh, what do you mean by the log? Ah, but we're not using locks here. So the, the entire goal here of optimistic concurrency control is we're not going to, uh, we're going to let the transactions do whatever they want, but because they're working on their own private copy of the database, it doesn't matter whether they break anything because we're not going to, uh, they're not actually going to break anything until we try and merge that private copy back into the, uh, the main database, until we try and git push, if you will. Okay, so we check to see all of the transactions that have committed since the transaction started. And what are we looking for? So remember, the, think of this as git push. When I do a git push, uh, I'm sure you've all encountered this by now, uh, someone else has modified the, the repository, uh, this transaction, you, you, you can't push. Do a pull first. A pull and a merge. What, what's it doing? What's it doing behind the scenes there to, to try and figure out whether or not uh, something that you've done conflicts? 
two tran okay, so the simplest thing to do is to see if any uh, any two oh, excuse me. Well, um, any two transactions modify the same object. So if the two transactions are completely independent of one another, then um, then you're safe. That's the easiest to check. But let's say hypothetically that there are two transactions that try and modify um, or at one tries to modify, the other tries to read um, the same transact, or the same object. So, if that happens, well, I mean, the simplest, simplest possible thing that you can check for is that the transactions are completely separate in time. And, uh, if the two transactions have absolutely no interaction, the first transactions read. Uh, first read occurs after the second uh, transaction's uh, write, then we're good. These two transactions are completely isolated. So the, the two basic properties are that the transactions don't interact because they're not modifying any of the same objects, or the two transactions don't interact because uh, the first one didn't start reading until the second one had already finished writing. Okay, so first question. Well, you already said this is sufficient. Is this efficient? Are these two basic properties enough to give us reasonable performance? Yeah, so we can do much better. immediately before the valid, I mean, you have to have, the timestamp is a way, uh, so the question is, uh, when do you uh, set up the, the timestamp before the validation phase or after the validation phase? Um, you need to have some idea of which transactions came before the one that you are checking. In order to, to do any kind of validation, you need to figure out which transactions happened earlier in time. Or you, at, at the very least, you need to split the transactions that you're looking at into ones that logically come before the one you're testing and the ones that come after the one you're testing. Uh, sorry? Uh, when another transaction comes, does that mean it's reading or writing? Uh, let me clarify, ask for a clarification. Do you mean uh, reading, to, uh, reading it or writing its own private copy or reading or writing the main database? Uh, private copy. Private copy. Um, so the trans... What I mean to say when I say transaction starts, it starts its read phase. So if a trend, yeah, so if the, the two transactions, one completely finishes before the other one completely uh, starts at all, we're, we're good. Um, but this is not necessarily super efficient. So maybe let's take a little bit more of a look at the objects that the transactions are manipulating. So if one transaction starts and modifies, uh, <clears throat> if one uh, transaction starts and modifies some records that another transaction reads from, well that's potentially a problem. Two transactions, uh, that's essentially a... Yeah. So, after we finish testing whether two transactions come uh, or one another... Actually, no, this is... Uh, sorry, excuse me. I'm one slide... operating one slide behind. This is the, uh, the second property that we, we talked about. So if the two transactions are completely independent in terms of time, then we're completely clear. Uh, and the second property is that if the two transactions, one transaction writes to a given object, the other transaction uh, reads from the object, 
then we need to make sure that those two uh, transactions are separate in time, or one transaction comes completely before the other. So we can test to see if there's any intersections between the right set of the earlier transaction, the, right, uh, the read set of the later transaction, and if there is, well, we've got a problem. And the second transaction can't commit. Okay, we talked about that. Good. So can we go further? Can we... So as long as the... As long as the right phase of one of these transactions... Uh, as long as one of these transactions finishes writing before the other transaction starts writing, we're good. Because there's no way that you can get any kind of interleaving between the two, um, the two transactions, at least in terms of writes. There's no way that uh, transaction K's writes uh, can get hidden by one of transaction I's writes. So we've addressed write-read conflicts, uh, sorry, write-before, write-after-read conflicts, and we've addressed write-after-write conflicts. But can we do better? Is there any case where we could interleave TI and TK even further? In other words, move TK even e earlier. So what's, the, what's blocking us from moving TK earlier at this point? Hmm? The right phase. So we can't allow the two right phases to occur at the same time. Why? Great. Right, so if the two are manipulating the same object and the right phases occur at the same time, we don't know which of those rights is going to win out. And because we've established the serial order that says that TK comes after TI, at least because TK's uh, validation phase starts later, then now we have a problem because we don't know which of those transactions will write second. So, simple thing we can do is test to see whether there's any overlap between the rights. So, if the two, right, uh, the two transactions, um, we can check to see if the second transaction's reads conflict with the first transaction's rights. We can check to see if the second transaction's rights conflict with the first transaction's reads. And, well, we need some sort of ordering between the two. So if uh, the, well, the transaction that finishes first, finishes first. So if all of this is satisfied, or if any of these three tests pass, then we are allowed to commit these two transactions at the same time because there's no chance that there's going to be any kind of conflict between them. So, this idea of optimistic concurrency control it relies on lots of comparisons. And so what are we doing just at a really low level? What are we doing when we check to see if the read set of one transaction conflicts with the write set of another transaction? 
OK, we're checking. Well, what do you mean by checking the timestamps? Well, here we only have uh, sets, right? We have a set of objects that transaction, re uh, that transaction I read from. We have a set of objects that, uh, oh, excuse me. We have a set of transaction of objects that transaction K read from. And we have a set of objects that transaction I wrote to. OK, so we, we, well, we can compare the time. Uh, we don't have timestamps on the individual objects. Uh, I, I think you're, uh, although that's a, that's a nice observation. Uh, I will get to it in a couple of slides. Um, in this case, the timestamps are on the transactions themselves. So we know transaction I comes first. Otherwise, we would be checking reads and writes in the other direction. So we know that transaction I came first, or we we assigned transaction I an earlier timestamp. Yep. So we check the trend, uh, the read set of the transaction of transaction K, and we check the read set, uh, the write set, excuse me, of transaction I. Now, what kind of an operation is that uh, when? We keep saying check. We check the two. What are we checking for? If there are common elements. We're checking to see if the intersection of those two sets is empty. Now, by this point, we've done joins quite a bit. Um, everyone here has implemented joins or has prob worked with their group mates to implement joins. Um, is that something we can do fast? OK, we can do, well, is that something we can do fast? Uh, when I, whenever I use uh, relative terms like fast or efficiently, one thing that should immediately pop into your mind is relative to what? So This validation phase needs to run really, really fast. Because, at least conceptually, the validation fa phase essentially blocks any of the transactions that follow it from committing. If I have transactions 4, 5, and 6, transaction 4 has to be fully validated before transaction 5 comes along. Uh, before transaction 5 can be validated, because there's a possibility that if transaction 4 doesn't get validated, what happens? Or what happens if, if a transaction doesn't, get viol uh, doesn't, get, doesn't pass the validation stage? Hmm? It aborts. And if transaction 4 and transaction 5 are um, touching the same data, then transaction 5 can't be committed until we know whether transaction 4 has aborted or committed. So we want to make this validation step extremely, extremely fast. And to put this in perspective, um, Database systems that deal with concurrent modifications need to be able to process, I think we're talking in the tens or even hundreds of thousands of transactions per second um, per database system. Uh, I think that's kind of the the well, the, the, the record for the TPCC benchmark, which is essentially transaction-based, is somewhere on the order of tens, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. So we're talking, basically, you get about 1 to 10 microseconds to decide whether or not 
uh, this transaction can be validated or not. And a set intersection, while it can be done pretty efficiently, we know how to do these uh, do set intersections pretty fast. You're also talking about a huge number of objects potentially that are being read and written by a given transaction. So you want to make sure that this validation step happens really, really fast. And how many set intersections are we doing in this step? Or uh, set intersections, just the total number of set intersections are we doing in this test? Anyone else? Oh, okay, two. So we're doing two set intersections here. What about here? How many are one set inter intersection? And here we're not doing any. So, oh, oops. so in each of these tests, we're doing progressively more and more work. And what's the trade-off? So we're doing more work during the validation stage. What does that extra work get us? More safety. And what do you mean by that? Um, let me rephrase that slightly. It's less likely that two transactions will be incorrectly detected as conflicting. So we're doing more work to reduce the amount of, uh, to reduce the chance that two transactions are detected as conflicting and as a consequence we'll, uh, we won't need to restart as many transactions. So I want to bring up a couple of uh, points uh, about the design of optimistic concurrency control systems. And these vary a little bit depending on implementation, but at least loosely, you need to perform these checks um, at least during the validation phase to make sure that the uh, transactions don't conflict. And that essentially means that large chunks of the validation phase act as a critical section. Um, and given, well, actually, not the. Not the entire write phase. But if the validation phase detects that there is a potential write write conflict between two transactions, the write phase, those two write phases need to be ordered as well. So one. Uh, one simple way of avoiding these kind of conflicts is to identify when a transaction is read only. And if it's read only, you don't need a write phase. You can avoid many of the checks that are being performed here. And all you really need to do is make sure that that transaction read from a consistent view of the database so that the, the transaction has no read conflicts. Okay, so at least loosely, we're doing extra work to figure out whether uh, two transactions might conflict. This is a trade-off that you need to make, but we can potentially do even better. And the idea of uh, the idea that we're going to try and push here is that rather than trying to track the objects on um, kind of a per transaction basis, we track the state of the objects and we detect when those objects, um, we, we detect conflicts on uh, kind of, well, okay, let me back up. The, the validation phase is kind of our bottleneck here. 
because we need to do this big set intersection, we need to do this big, uh, or potentially multiple set intersections, and if we don't do those correctly, if, or if we skip those, there's a good chance that we're going to get uh, conflicts. Oh, excuse me, there's a good chance that we're going to get more conflicts and therefore need to do more work. Now, this approach of pushing the validation all the way to an end step is something we could potentially avoid if we tracked information about the objects themselves. And so this, this leads to a specialization of optimistic concurrency control called timestamp concurrency control. So as before, all of the transactions have a timestamp associated, associated with them uh, that gives us a order in which the transactions are conceivably evaluated, or conceptually evaluated. But now, in addition to, um, rather than tracking the individual read sets and write sets of the transactions, we're going to track what has, we're going to track a history for each of the objects. So each of the objects is now going to get uh, two timestamps associated with it. Uh, a read timestamp and a write timestamp. And every time a transaction reads from an object, it's going to update the read timestamp. Every time it writes, it's going to update the write timestamp. Any questions on that? Or any of the other optimistic concurrency control stuff we've... Yeah? So the question is, is this more expensive than, uh, the validate, than doing validation uh, up front? In aggregate, you're completely correct. This is, uh, this is doing a lot more work because, as you point out, every single object you read or write from, you need to modify. Or at least you need to modify some chunk of memory. But... The difference here, when is the work being done? So in the optimistic concurrency control, when do you do all of that work? During the validation phase. So after the read phase completes, you do this big, you take all of the, the, the work that you need to do to check and you do it all at once. Here, where is the work being performed? Right, so every time I read an object, I modify that object. Every time I write an object, I modify that object. So I do more work, and I have a lot, of, a lot more critical sections because I need to certainly uh, lock the timestamps before modifying them. But those critical sections are much, much smaller because they're much, much smaller and they're scattered, they're more evenly distributed throughout the entire transaction. So there's a much, uh, there are far fewer kind of major blocking steps. So while you're doing more work, you have much smaller critical sections and therefore you can do much more in parallel. Does that address your question? So, again, the idea you have each uh, transaction has a timestamp, each object has a read timestamp, and a write timestamp. And every time a transaction, uh, a transaction reads from a given object, it's going to see if the, transaction, uh, the object was written more recently than, uh, than its own timestamp. So if a later transaction came along and wrote to this one object, then we have a problem. In other words, the transaction essentially encounters a conflict and has to abort. If the transaction is earlier, the read is safe. So it's going to update the read timestamp so that it's the later of its own timestamp or whatever read timestamp is already on the object. Any questions? <laughs> 
All right. Uh, writes look almost exactly the same. The read time, uh, you check to see if the transaction um, is writing to an object that has been read by a later transaction. And if it has, abort and restart. Um, or um, if the transact uh, if the transaction has been is trying to write to a object that has been written to by a later transaction, we cause a dirty read. But the solution here is simple. What would happen to the to, uh, to the value if the transactions had executed in the correct order? If I try and update uh, O with one, and a later transaction comes along and updates it with two. Value of O is already two. I come along, I've got my right of one. Well, what would the, what should I do? Uh, abort, can I do better? So, hmm? yeah, just use the updated. Don't, uh, if two transactions are in the system and uh, both of them try writing to the object, whichever transaction has the later timestamp is the one that's finally going to, uh, is the one that's going to uh, end up with its value in that object. Transaction two writes a two, transaction one writes a one. Two has the higher timestamp, so the object should end up with a two in it. If transaction two happens to come along first and perform its write first, before transaction one has a chance to write it, well, all you do is skip the write. I mean, the, the write, transaction one's write would just get thrown away anyway, so uh, don't bother ignoring it, just ignore the write. Anyway, if those two conditions are satisfied, then uh, transaction I will write to the object and update the write timestamp. Okay, so this introduces one potential problem in that, well, what happens here? If I have the sequence of operations. What, what's happening with transaction one? Someone in the back maybe? What's the state of transaction one at the very end? It's uncommitted. Transaction one is just sitting there. It's doing nothing. But it's still written to uh, transaction uh, it's written to something that transaction two has read from. And that's a problem because if transaction one happens to abort at any point, which it's well within its rights to do, or if the system crashes, which is effectively an abort for transaction one, then transaction two has to abort as well because it's read a value that is straight up incorrect. So the loose version, uh, the, the two potential solutions here um, are to wait with actually performing the writes until the, the writer commits. Uh, and, or excuse me, the, the solution here is to simply uh, not actually commit the write until the writer actually commits. Kind of similar to the working with a private copy that we talked about earlier. Um, and, well, there's really no, no way around it. Um, any transaction that reads from O has to, or reads from an object, um, has to wait until all of the earlier transactions that modified that object have com uh, committed as well. 
This is kind of like locking, but not entirely the same. OK, let's go back to one thing here. We have, yeah, we have a few minutes. So recall that when a transaction tries to read from an object, that read is only safe if the version that we're reading from is uh, one that came before the transaction that we're currently looking at. So if another later transaction tried to write to that object, or did write to that object, then we have a problem. Can we avoid that? So, I'll give a quick example here. Let's say you have three transactions. T1, 2, and T3. And T2 eventually does a read for some object. T1 does a write to, some, to the object. Oh, oops, too much. And, okay, so T1 writes to the object. T2 does a bunch of stuff. T3 writes to the object and then T2 reads from the object. Would that, what would happen here? So what's the object's timestamp at this point? Or write timestamp, excuse me. One. T3 comes along, the write timestamp is safe to write to, so what's its timestamp? Three. T2 comes along here, checks the write timestamp. Is it allowed to read? No. Is three is greater than two? Problem. We need to abort transaction two and restart it. Can we do better? Hmm? What do you mean by read the object again? Uh, I mean, we could essentially restart the transaction, which would cause the read to happen again, uh, at which point it would be T4. But then we need to restart the transaction. So if the transaction has been doing a bunch of other stuff, then all that stuff has to happen all over again. Uh, Okay, so we could potentially promote the timestamp of T2, but again, whatever it's been doing here has been using the timestamp 2. So now we'd have to update all of those things, which is almost, a, not quite as bad, but almost as bad as doing the entire transaction from scratch. So fundamentally, what's the problem here? Why are we not allowed to read from O? Because T3 came along and overwrote the value that we actually should have read. Exactly. So, well, one simple solution that we could potentially try out is what if we kept the version that transaction one wrote? And this is, uh, this leads us to kind of the last variation of uh, optimistic concurrency control that we're going to talk about. And the idea is quite simply, uh, 
well, it's called multi-version timestamp concurrency control. And well, quite simply, in addition to keeping the object itself, you keep around a pool of versions of the object, um, just historical versions of the object. So if transaction two comes along and it tries to read, it'll read from the version, um, whatever version existed when the transaction uh, at, at its read timestamp. In other words, you just find the newest version that has, uh, whose write timestamp is uh, correct. OK, um, that is about it. One thing I want to bring up just quickly before finishing up is I've been hand waving this idea of um, operating on private copies and having some way of reverting to earlier copies. So what we're going to get into in the next couple of lectures, well, after the Project 3 review on um, Wednesday, is how do we actually implement that efficiently? And the solution, as uh, many solutions in databases, is going to be something called logging, or is going to be logging. All right, uh, any, que any final questions? Yeah. Uh, why would that write? Uh, the write is allowed. It's the, the uh, subsequent read that isn't allowed. So we're assuming that the transaction, uh, the question is why is the read not allowed? Um, the basic assumption, so at some point we need to impose a serial order. We need to decide, and part of the trade-off that we've been implicitly making throughout the, the lecture is where that, tr uh, where that ordering gets determined. The idea in timestamp uh, t timestamp concurrency control is that that order gets determined before the read phase starts. Every transaction gets assigned a timestamp. And in this case, T1, T2, and T3 have timestamps 1, 2, and 3. In other words, transaction 1 conceptually occurs first, transaction 2 conceptually occurs second, transaction 3 conceptually occurs third. And anything that violates that view of the world um, has to essentially causes the transaction to abort. Now, in this case, transaction 2 is trying to read from a value that was written by transaction 3. And that violates this order that we've tried to establish. In other words, that could only happen if transaction two came after transaction three. And because that violates the order we've been trying to establish, we have to restart the transaction. Does that address your question? Sorry? Uh, it's an arbitrary selection, but we, uh, I mean, at some point we have to pick an order. And in timestamp concurrency control, you pick that order before doing anything, before the transaction starts. And so we've arbitrarily chosen transaction one to occur first, transaction two to occur second, and transaction three to occur third, because that's the order they arrived in. All right, so see everyone on uh, Wednesday.